In that season, all the women in that season, all the women you dated looked and were like you because you were so desperate to love yourself, but you were unable to. So you chose women who were like you to love because you had so much self-hate. Wow. And it was that experience over and over and over again of let's unpack what was really going on when you were having these attractions, what was happening, that it demystified the whole experience for me. I grew up in the 80s. Yeah. Or 70s, so okay. 70s and 80s. And, and so I probably had never heard of lesbianism until I was almost out of high school. Okay. I had never seen it on television, or if it had been on television, it's kind of interesting to look at like reruns of Cheers or yeah. and say, oh, here's this innuendo, here are these sexual innuendos. And as a young person, I didn't pick up on those things. Yeah. It was really, I would say, naive. I grew up in a rural community. Um, so when I think about what, what was same-sex attraction for me and how I navigated that, I didn't understand there what I was... There was a track record for it. Right? There was no I mean, cultural expression of there that There was no, that de no definition. Yeah. And, and honestly, I think that the fact that we have a definition causes many of us to go, is this, is this what that is? Am I having same-sex attraction right now? Hmm. Um, just because it's so prevalent, it's on our... It's on our shared consciousness right now. Yeah. But for me as a child, I was like, what is this? Is this healthy? Is it not? Um, was more the question I had as opposed to, am I a lesbian or am I same-sex attracted? That kind of mm -hmm. phrasing. Yeah. I don't think I would have said I'm same-sex attracted until well after I had started my first major relationship with a woman. Okay. Um, so growing up, so I have this, this period in my life when I was sexually abused, molested as a probably, I think, four or five years old based on my memories. Mm -hmm. um, and that for me caused this really big breakdown in connection with my gender. Yeah. So what started, what that began for me was a, a, I kind of, I went into hiding. That's all I can say. Now, I don't think that that, period of abuse was the real starting point for my same-sex attraction. Honestly, I would say, and, and I can say this because I have so analyzed my childhood, yeah. right? I mean, we were just talking, I can't tell you how many times I've shared my story. And over the course of God unraveling the whole thing, I've really scrutinized my life more than mm. most, more than yeah. most people. But so if I, if I look at the trajectory of my life where kind of the breakdowns of my childhood development and, and I want to say broadly that most people who experience same-sex attraction, it's, it is very strongly anchored in childhood development. It's not necessarily anchored in trauma mm -hmm. or abuse. It's, it's not necessarily anchored in breakdown of, re, of relationship. It is a developmental issue. Like, there may be a biological factor. That's what science is telling us. But the biology is not enough. It's the socialization it's okay. the trajectory, and then it's the developmental issues, the perceptions you form as a child based on the experiences you have. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, I could be a twin and have a relationship with my uncle, and I might end up feeling affirmed by my, by my uncle, but my twin feel rejected by my uncle. Our yeah. perception of that experience is going to change our sense of self. And so same-sex attraction, in my opinion, is so complex, but it, it is compounded over years of developmental factors, mm. all right? And so one of the core issues for me was that I had an attachment issue with my mom. Um, it wasn't just that I had a breakdown in my relationship with my mom. It was yeah. that if I looked generationally at my mom with her mom and her mom with her mom, like there was some kind of breakdown in bonding. My mom didn't have a great relationship with her mom. And I felt rejected from a very, very young age. And I think it was because my mother didn't really know how to bond with me. Okay. All right? So I felt, if you, <laughs> if you look at me, at, at photos of me as a very young child, I, 
I, I felt distant from everybody else. I felt other than everybody else. So then I add a layer of sexual abuse. That caused me to say, I am not safe. So how can I feel safe? Yeah. And for me, like, my father and my brother represented <clears throat> safety. And so I started um, becoming what we'd call gender non-conforming, kind of from age five. It's interesting, if you look at photos of me, yes. I've got pink pinafore and then suddenly give me cowboy boots and a, and a yeah. cowboy, like yeah. I cut off. I insisted that my mom cut my hair. Like there's, a, there's an obvious breaking point. That's being expressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Without you recognizing what it is. No, time. no, I, I wasn't saying, oh, I'm gender non-conforming. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I was saying, this suddenly feels much safer, much more comfortable. I feel much more, um, yeah, comfortable and at home in mm -hmm. this than a pink pinafore or a dress. Yeah. Or, and then suddenly wearing a dress, like by the time I was eight, nine, ten, it, it felt um, foreign. It was just foreign. It's like, I don't even understand. Does this look right? I don't understand. Yeah. And my relationship with my mom at about 10, up to about 10, um, I, don't, I don't really know. I don't really remember my relationship with my mom very well. But at about that age, my mom went to work full time. And my mom was um, a feminist activist. So both my parents went to university, and, um, which for my parents, my dad, they were both born in the 30s. Mm. And, and so uh, my father just passed away, and he's in his late, he was in his late 80s. So my, my parents were well-educated, and my mom was um, very involved or very um, affected by the feminist movement. And I, I recognized as a child that my brother and I kind of caused some hurt for my mom because in her generation or in that setting, rural Illinois um, or central Illinois, the priority when you had children was to raise your children. You know, there wasn't anyone when my mom was in her 20s, you know, going to work Mm -hmm. and sending their children to daycare. That was just not super common. Yeah. Yeah. So when, you know, my mom had my brother and I pretty late, and she was in her 30s, which is, was late for, for her generation. Um, my brother and I kind of represented a loss of a dream for her. Hmm. So she went from being um, involved, socially active and a professional to having children and staying home. Now, I don't, I don't think that she... She didn't regret having us. She didn't not love us. We were not abused. I didn't have a, a, a tough family. I was never abused. My parents never divorced. There was never yeah. conflict. It wasn't dysfunctional. Um, but for my mom, I and I, I always felt like I was in her way. And and so then, here I am. I don't I don't relate to her. I rejected her pretty firmly. So then by the time I got into high school, what was appealing to most of my friends, my girlfriends, was not really appealing to me. Now, I was still trying to date men. I didn't have the perspective that dating women was a thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so I dated when, men when I was in high school, but that was super scary for me. Um, I've, I felt abused. I've, I felt used by men as a teen. So then, here, I went to a, I was always involved in church. I grew up in the Presbyterian church. And the setting, my parents were intellectuals, so the setting that I grew up in was pretty heady. Um, and so um, the church setting that I grew up in was not, um, it was probably the seedbed for social justice um, Christianity. And, um, but I loved it. I've always loved theology, always loved church history. Um, so I went to this international church gathering and it was in that setting that I met someone that was really, became one of the most important people of my life. 
And she was the first person that I really resonated with, who I felt saw me completely, who I could share everything that I was feeling, I could process everything with. It was really the first time I felt seen and cherished by another person. Mm -hmm. And it was meaningful. Yeah, Um, because it gives identity. It yeah. provides a sense like, of identity. Suddenly yeah. someone sees me for who I truly am. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, I wasn't saying she sees me because I'm a lesbian and I'm truly a lesbian. It was, yeah. she sees me for all of my nerdiness and, and, and you know, the things that I love. And she loves that, you know. Um, and, and that set me on the trajectory of going deeper and deeper in relationship with her. And she was the first person to introduce me to lesbianism. So really, you know, it was through some novels and some books and things that we were reading. Art. Art, yeah. you know, we were like, this is us. Yeah. But I also, you know, I also knew socially, this is not what I should be doing, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't have a sense of, um, I need to make something significant out of these feelings and this relationship. Instead, I need to stay on this path of getting my, I wanted to get my graduate degrees. I I went to university for a couple of years in Europe and I intended to start my grad degree and and study historical theology um, when I was in my early 20s. But I ended up getting married to a man and right out of college And after not quite two years of of living with him, I was starting to fail mentally and emotionally. I was really starting to struggle. Now, all through my life, I had experienced ups and downs and um, periods of severe depression. And and in my teenage years, it was really significant. I really pushed my family away. I, I didn't... I didn't have the ability to really create healthy relationships with anybody, it seemed to me, except for these few women that I was connected with. And even there, I didn't really feel fully known, but by a few. And so then I married this man and my emotional health just tanked. And I I experienced a mental breakdown. I had a a full-blown manic episode and then was hospitalized. And in the hospital, I was um, just trying to figure out what, is, what has happened. How did I get here? And I determined that all the, you know, the strain for me of being married to him was indication that the truth of my life was that I was a lesbian, mm. that I had been trying to put myself into this other box. Now, at this point, I had moved from the Midwest to the West Coast, And um, obviously I was exposed to all the things once I was in college and in Europe and then ending up in the West Coast, close to the Bay Area. And I was like, in my heart, I thought this must be the answer. And so uh, getting out of the hospital, I came out as a lesbian. I left, I moved out, I left my marriage, um, filed for divorce and moved to a metropolitan gay neighborhood and I just fully, fully enveloped myself in that world. Mm -hmm. And I I, I would say that um, it was a safety net for me. So leading up to that point, I had tried to do ministry leadership and that had never, that hadn't been fulfilling. It hadn't been successful. And um, so coming out and going into the gay community, I felt, um, I felt belonging and acceptance that I had never felt before. Uh, and in that setting, you know, I just gave myself completely to this fresh new identity. I shaved my head. I started getting tattoos and piercings and, um, I've, I've always been, um, can I say, I, I've always loved to push the envelope. Like I, I moved from home at 17 to study in Europe 
So I've, I've always liked to press, press into challenges, yeah, yeah. you know? Um, so I sold my car, got a fresh new BMW motorcycle, and just dove in <laughs> Absolutely to necessary. that world, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, I would say that emotionally, in, in that world, the gay community kept me alive. So this was all during my 20s, from my early 20s to 29. Yeah. When I was 28, um, so meanwhile, I had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder by virtue of these manic episodes that I was having. Mm-hmm. Then I started taking more and more medication. So my experience in the gay community, it on the one hand felt refreshing and I felt a place of belonging. On the other hand, my mental and emotional health were completely imploding. Mm. All right, now I couldn't say that it was because I was in the gay community that my, my mental health was, was failing, but I was losing my mind. That's what I felt like. And I was, you know, by the time I was 29, I had been hospitalized more than once, multiple times. And um, my family saw me. At one point, my parents called. And I was not in the habit of talking to my parents. So they did not know that I had come out. They did not, I had not been home. How long of a period of time that they didn't know? Probably six years. Six years. So you kept that underneath kept the radar that, for six yeah. years. Okay. They might have suspected something, but it was never something we talked mm-hmm. about. I mean, they, they, I'm assuming they knew you moved location, mm-hmm. different jobs, different stuff, but you never expressed that part of your life mm-hmm. to them or had a conversation about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so when I was 28, they called, and I remember sitting listening to the phone ring, and then the voice at the um, answering machine picked up before voicemail. (laughs) And I listened to them, and I picked up the phone, but I wasn't able to talk. And um, that night I had been, you know, all during that time I had been different levels of suicidal. And, And that night I was like, I really need help. So I picked up the phone, but I wasn't able to talk. And so that night, my parents booked a flight, and my mom flew out, which was horrifying for me. I wanted my dad to fly out. He sent my mom. She came out, helped me get into a hospital where I stayed for a while. She stayed with me for about a month while I stabilized. And everyone determined that I couldn't live on my own anymore. Hmm. And so they, uh, they packed up my apartment and they moved me back to the Midwest. And, you know, uh, that, was, that was so incredibly painful. I, I, had, a, I had a steady girlfriend. Um, I just had to say goodbye to her. You know, I didn't tell my parents anything about that. Yeah. And so, and by say goodbye to her, you mean I had to because my mom was here. Yeah, had to you just had to break it up. Detached. I pretty much okay. broke off my relationship with her. Yeah, and was that out of fear of your mom? Um, yeah, I just could not. I did not yet. want to. I I just couldn't. I couldn't okay. deal with that. Okay. And so, um, so my parents moved me back to the, to Illinois, where they lived. And I moved in with them. And for the next year then, I, I spent every week seeing a psychiatrist or a counselor, psychologist. And I was, I, it took the entire year for my medications to be leveled off. I spent times over-medicated, times under-medicated. Um, I had to get regular blood tests for my lithium levels. And by the time, in 2000, um, I, you know, so in, in 1999, I approached my pastor and I said, so in this little Presbyterian church, I said, I just need, I feel like I just need to go back to where this all started. Mm-hmm. And 
My first mental breakdown occurred when I let go of a scholarship that I had been given to attend Vanderbilt. So I decided to apply again to Vanderbilt and then also to a seminary in Chicago and um, got full ride scholarships for both and decided to go to Chicago because it was closer to my psychiatrist. And this is at what age? This is at age? I was age 30. 30, okay. So this is in 2000. And um, so I approached my pastor and he agreed to write a recommendation for me as long as I came out. So I, so I came out. Um, that was that was good and bad. So coming out um, to my family or to my church, that was a, another level in comparison to coming out when I moved into the gay community, right? So I could come out in, in California and, and slide into the gay community and hardly anyone knew me. There was, there were no relationships to be lost. So, at the time, I was on the board of elders for my Presbyterian church. So, I, I met with them all and came out and, and resigned. Um, I don't usually get this emotional, so. It's okay. Um, I had to resign because you couldn't be openly gay and in ministry. And I came out to my parents and um, my parents were okay. Like they didn't say hit the road. Um, my dad especially was affirming and my mom was just kind of like, I don't know what's happening, but okay. And um, so I moved, started my seminary degree and um, attended seminary openly gay. And I was probably one of a half a dozen students at the time who were open about their sexuality. And, and when I showed up, like most of the people that I knew that became my friends were um, championing me, championing me in that decision to be open. Um, and so I started that. I was on this huge amount of medication. All right, and I want to say, like, I was taking antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds and sleeping meds and anti-psychotic meds, as well as lithium, to try to keep everything together. And I, I was hoping in going to seminary that I would start to get free of some of that. Like, if I, you know, my here's my dream. Yeah. You know, if I can start to engage yeah. what yeah. I think is my destiny and my calling, yeah. can will some of this dissipate? Yeah. But actually what started happening was the opposite. Mm. I was there in that environment, and I was in that environment deconstructing my faith, kind of, like stripping the mysterious out of scripture, yeah. and then bringing in um, feminist and liberation theology and bringing in a newly emerging gay theology. Mm -hmm. And all of that, instead of bolstering my faith, um, quite caused me to, to really question um, or to lose connection to who God really is in the context of social justice. Mm. Um, I started doing ministry in the gay community, um, regularly did an outreach in the gay community, and, and really our heart was, so we, we thought, since, since we're born this way, uh, that's what we believed, since we're born that, this way, uh, it's impossible to change, mm -hmm. and, and so God create, must have created us this way, no one changes. Therefore, 
we're, we must have to change the church in order to bring the gay community in. And so our, our commitment was, we want the gay community to hear the gospel, but the only way for them to hear the gospel is if the church changes. All right, instead of, ah, oh, the gospel has power, God has power, God is redemptive, God has a vision for our sexuality, and he can do it. Instead of thinking that, we kind of lowered the ante. We can't, we can't make God do anything, so we're gonna do something. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, I feel like our heart was right, but in it, God wasn't there. He wasn't there for me. And at the end of my degree, um, so as I ended, I was trying to get an MDiv because my thought was, at some point, the church will start to ordain gays and lesbians, right? So in 2003, we were far from that yeah. in the Presbyterian church. It wasn't until, I think, close to 2013 that that was possible. Um, but I thought, I will get this degree and someday be ordained. But in the end, in my final year, I ended up spending a month in the hospital. And, and a month-long ho hospitalization in a mental hospital is a really long hospitalization. Mm. Okay. It, is, it is maybe if, you're, if you've broken your leg, it's a long hospitalization. Yeah. But for the mental hospital, it's a That's long extreme, hospital. Yeah. yeah. And by the time I got out, um, the, my, my leaders at, at the seminary didn't have confidence that I was going to be able to complete that degree ever. And so... They agreed to award me um, a master's in theology, which is not a degree that I could be ordained with. Um, so I, I, I accepted that degree, um, but was heartbroken because it meant I would never be able to do ministry as I saw it. Yeah. Um, but I left that environment, moved then to uh, kind of extreme rural Southern Illinois, which is the most impoverished part of Illinois. Like, you know, the inner city ghetto of Chicago um, is not the most impoverished part of Illinois. Actually, the extreme rural part of Illinois is the most impoverished. So I moved down there, which is where my, my parents had been born. And my grandmother lived there. And she was one of the most important people in my life. My grandmother was um, a really strong woman. And um, she went to college in the 1920s and became a teacher and became the first woman principal in, in Southern Illinois. And growing up, I mean, yeah, she was a pillar. And so at that time she was in her 90s. I moved from Chicago down there and started living with her because she was experiencing some dementia mm -hmm. and she had a daytime caregiver, but no one at night. And so I thought, well, I'm not sleeping at night. Yeah. <laughs> Can I move, you know, would it be okay for me? Because I, my other choice was living with my parents in my mid thirties, which is not yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. So I moved in with my grandmother and, and we had many, many quality hours at four o'clock in the morning together. And it was in that season then that I started doing a little bit of youth ministry in a nearby church in that area and then met another youth pastor. And at this time, you're still um, openly lesbian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, if you can picture this in the early 2000s, here I am. You know, I've got my truck, I've got my motorcycle, I've got my HRC, Human Rights Campaign sticker, and my Pride <laughs> stickers, and... Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I used to have a crew cut, so I pretty much shaved my head all the time. I, I hated women's clothes, so I did my best to always look as masculine or as androgynous as I possibly could. It wasn't that I wanted to be a man, but I didn't want to be a woman. And uh, so I stood out. <laughs> I mean, 
And this is early 2000s. This is early 2000s, yeah, this is early 2000s in 2000s. rural Illinois. This is my generation. <laughs> right. You know, like, even today in that area, there are not openly gay people. So I stood yeah. out. And um, this youth pastor thought, so at one point, he was... He was doing he was doing tent making, so he had a side job, and he was doing some labor, and saw me. I, we had hired him to do some work, tree trimming on my grandmother's property, and um, the Lord highlighted me to him, and he thought she must need to know the gospel. So he he did what he could to witness to me. I remember he walked up to me and. He had been trying to figure out an easy way to speak to me um, for a couple of weeks. And, and you were ministering there with a youth group. Yeah, I mean, I was a pastor. At a lesbian, okay, so you're a youth pastor. I was a, at a, le, at a, I, uh, at a Presbyterian. At a Presbyterian church. Yeah. So I was a youth pastor doing just minimal youth pastor work, like a mm -hmm. small, small group of kids. Yeah. Um, nevertheless, it was ministry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... Um, he approached me thinking, I'll share the gospel with her. And so he walked up to me and he said... As a youth minister or you know, pastor you know, He said, yeah. so um, where are you going? Because I had asked him to move some equipment so that I could get my truck out of the way and drive off. And, and, and I said, well, I'm a pastor and I'm going to the church office. <laughs> and, and I mean, I think visibly I could see all the blood drain from his face. It was like, no, this does not compute. You he know, didn't like, have a roadmap. He was like, this was not what I was expecting. Like, oh, that was so funny. <laughs> but, you know, in my mind, I thought, what, a woman can't be a pastor? Yeah. I didn't think, oh, you think I'm a lesbian and I'm going, like, that was mm -hmm. not what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so funny. But that, out of that then emerged a relationship because we he he recovered and we started sharing notes oh you're a youth pastor okay well let's just talk about it and, and it turned out that he was part of a ministry staff uh, that had planted a youth outreach and they had probably 50 or 60 kids attending a couple times a week and and for a town of 5,000 that's a pretty good sized youth ministry yeah, yeah. and so They were meeting in a vacant um, car dealership. And one night, <laughs> he said, hey, we're, we're meeting this Thursday night. I feel like everywhere you've gone, you've been 10 years ahead. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so he said, why don't you come tonight? And um, I wanted to see what they were doing. I'd never, hadn't been there. And so <laughs> they had been teaching on the gifts of the Spirit and on the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that night, um, their, their worship looked like this. So they had a really gifted worship leader, really gifted. She used a five disc CD player and she would pray through the day, okay, what am I sensing from the Lord? She'd put in these five CDs And then through the night, she would, shift, she would see what the Lord is moving on, and she would shift the CDs to the different songs. Wow. She was 17. Mm. Well, that night, you know, the Holy Spirit just showed up in power. And there were kids weeping, and people were on the ground. Some of them were running around. Like, I really had never seen anything like that before. Like, in fact, when I share my story, often from the podium, I'll say, It was a Presbyterian's worst nightmare. I mean, it was, like, I was a dignified hymn-singing Presbyterian. Like, yeah. I didn't even raise, not, not even my hands this high in yeah. singing. And so here are these expressive kids and contemporary rock band worship. And not that I, was, I wasn't unfamiliar with that, but what I was unfamiliar with was the effectiveness of it in worship. Mm. And um, seeing kids being filled with the Spirit, I had never seen that before. I had never seen um, kind of a mystical or a supernatural expression like that. Never seen anyone or heard anyone speak in tongues. All of that was new. And it was terrifying. Like, in, in, 
in me, and I had a lot of, probably a lot of spiritual oppression too, it was very uncomfortable. But I, I resolved to stay, and so I'm, I'm on the ground too, just kind of kneeling, watching what's happening, and a 17-year-old boy approached me, and he said, I believe I have a word from the Lord for you. And um, I, I, I like to pause right there because that is a courageous young man to walk up to a lesbian. Maybe yeah. you've never talked to one before. Yeah. So he comes up with this word and it, it was something very personal. And I knew exactly, I knew exactly what he was talking about. It was a specific answer to prayer. Mm. And I remember thinking, hmm, I have, is it possible that God knows who I am specifically? And if that's the case, I have no idea who God is. And did what any, any seminary trained person would do in that moment maybe. Um, I resolved to research. Hmm. So I um, picked up a new Bible and I began highlighting in the Bible every place where God describes himself. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't looking for, is homosexuality sin? Yeah. I wasn't looking for, how do you start living? I was looking specifically. What would you say you were hungry for in that moment? Like, you're looking for something. You're looking for places where God describes himself. But what were you actually hungry for in that moment? Like, what started that search? Or just that moment of going through scripture? The truth. Like, if, if God can be accessed, what, who is he? Who is he really? Like, um, what are the implications of a God who is available and real? Now, I had gone to seminary, like searching for that answer, like, can, is God alive? Yeah. Now, um, maybe someone can understand or resonate with this. If you've tried to kill yourself, I would say probably the most, um, the most, precious thing for me in, in terms of my own sense of identity and well-being is my ability to think, my ability to study and communicate and to learn and to teach. And my identity is really wrapped up in those things and it always has been. And I was losing my mind. Like, by the time I entered seminary, I hadn't worked a full-time job. I hadn't I had to organize my days in, in five, 10, 15 increments sometimes, mm -hmm. scheduling it out so that I knew that if I got caught up in a reverie or if I had a psychotic moment or I could say, oh, it's three o'clock, what should I be doing? Yeah. So the possibility that God was alive, that he was accessible, and that he was good, meant that there was possible hope for me and my future. Like, I really didn't, at that time, I didn't believe that I would live very much longer. And I did, I felt that way because I never knew if I would have some kind of manic episode or some kind of psychotic episode and kill myself. Mm. I was a victim of my own mental illness. You know, lesbianism was not my life dominating problem. It was my effort for comfort. It was my effort to survive. It, it was what I turned to in order to cope, it, it, to, you know, to get any sense of well-being, any sense of nurture and relationship. Um, so you started going through scripture and writing. So I, I started highlighting every scripture where God describes himself. 
And what I began getting a picture of was, you know, how many times the faithfulness, the truth, the mercy, the compassion, the loving kindness of God is mentioned over and over and over again. Um, the graciousness of God. Um, the, the comfort of his presence. The, the beauty of his intent for our well-being. All of those things. If you isolate a study to just the spaces where his character emerge, mm. you get a very robust picture of a benevolent, sovereign, beautiful, yeah. gracious God. And I, I thought, if, if God is perfection, moral excellence, the perfection of beauty, and I could have full communion with him, then I could be redeemed. Redeemed from my inability to find connect, the connection that I needed or that I wanted with other people. You know, my, I could be redeemed from the emotional enmeshment or the emotional ties that I found with women. I could be, my mind would be sound. I could be, you know, redeemed in, in my sense of security and safety as a woman. I, I could have purpose and meaning for my life because he would be that trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I pursued that and his presence because I knew my life depended on it. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't risk compromise. I couldn't, I couldn't think, I'll try this. I, I actually, at that point in my life, that was the only way forward. And, and so for that, I ended up jumping in with a level of surrender that maybe other people don't. Because I was constrained in my belief that here's this ray of hope for my future and my future well-being. And no matter what it looks like, I didn't, like, I honestly was not at that point grappling with, oh, I'm going to have to let go of lesbianism. Mm -hmm. I was grappling because I believed that I had been born gay. God wasn't talking to me about my yeah. sexuality. He was talking to me about the hope for my life and a thriving future. Mm. Um, complete self-actualization in the presence of a magnanimous God. That's what I began to think. That's what I began to feel. And I, I started to be able to experience his presence. And, and that, you know, Yeah, so I, I accepted this invitation from the Lord to start looking for him beyond what I could make happen myself. Mm. So I started going to every holy, holiness Pentecostal church I could find, <laughs> yeah. you know, with, um, I would show up there in all my glorious uh, shaved head and there'd be women whose hair down to their, because they can't cut their hair. And Which that's not necessarily desirable either. No, <laughs> you know, but it's like, I, I just, that was the only, go. it was the only place I, I, I went everywhere I could, where I could see God moving outside of my thought life. So I would go to a Pentecostal church if they were having a healing service and see yeah. people fall down. I wanted to see people fall down or manifestations happen. I didn't necessarily want them to happen to me, but I wanted to see it. Yeah. I wanted to see God yeah. was alive. Yeah. And um, probably after about a year of that, then I started understanding, I started to get language for how to hear the Lord how to communicate with the Lord. I actually, I um, went to some children's, I went to some children's programs where they were teaching children how to hear from the Lord and in the church that I was attending. And I listened to what they were teaching. Like, how do you start to communicate with God? And 
I also, so I would go in, I, in that season, I would have times when I would have a really severe dip, like incommunicado, mm -hmm. and the Lord could meet me there. Um, I wasn't just caught up in a reverie. I could actually have a sense of his presence. I could yeah. start to, to it was starting, I was starting to get healthier yeah. in my mind. And then I started, by that time, I've read the whole Bible again. And then I'm looking at lesbianism and womanhood, femininity, and questioning. So now at this point, I, I am seeing God and I'm beginning to see myself. This is John Calvin. If you see yourself clearly, you can only see yourself clearly after having seen God. And so I am learning authentically who I am the longer I sit before the Lord. And I'm realizing, oh, why do I have a disconnect between me and womanhood? Clearly God's will, looking at scripture, is that I would be a woman. And so where is this breakdown? Why, why have I so rejected that? And, and then, you know, where is lesbianism in the Bible? I, I can theologically find, maybe I can eisegete David and Jonathan or some other segment of scripture where there might be a man-man relationship, but that is not possible for women. And so I'm, I'm sitting here going, lesbianism is really, and even historically lesbianism is underrepresented. And, and so that all, it caused a bit of an existential crisis. Like this is, this, there's something about this that is not real. It's, it's not true. And um, it was at that point when I started backing away from that identity and saying, I, I don't know what this looks like because I, be, I can't be that woman. Um, I don't understand what that would look like or to, to even long for. Now at this point, even though I had, had relationship with um, men. You couldn't imagine now that Now at this scenario, point, like, yeah, I, I yeah. could not picture doing that and I didn't know how to even make a relationship with a man meaningful. Like, it was so undesirable is what I want to say. Mm -hmm. And so, I, said, I don't even know about that, but I don't, I can't risk hanging on to that if there's a possibility that I won't actually get God. Because I saw my, my connection to God as being my lifeline. So I wanted that no matter what. And so I began, I went into a season of letting go, cutting off everything I could that I thought would, had hindered me. I thought, how is it possible that I've gotten this far in the Christian church and I've never experienced this? I've never known this about God and I've never been introduced into this communion with God with these parameters. And... Um, so I did an assessment. I began, I got, you know, I, I released myself from my education in many ways and um, repented of lesbianism. I, re I repented of agreements that I felt I had made against the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, and from that point then, things started to rapidly shift for me in my sense of um, emotional well-being. So... Soon after that, I got married to a man, my husband today, and I wasn't finished with lesbianism when we got married. You know, I wasn't, I still struggled. I still struggled emotionally and mentally. Like, if I were discipling someone today, I would definitely not recommend, oh, this yeah. is what you should do. Yeah. But I trusted, I, I trusted that this is what I should be doing and the elders around me and around my husband also. And we both put ourselves into an environment where we would be in community while I worked out the rest of my healing. And that meant addressing fully the sexual abuse, the, the, um, the radical breakdown of my femininity in the context of my marriage where it could be fully explored. That was the path the Lord had for me. And so we got married in 2005. And um, by 2000, in 2008, 
Well, in 2007, I did a 40 day fast and I went off all of my meds. So from 2003 to 2007, I had needed, over that time I started cutting off more and more than meds. I needed less anxiety medication. I didn't need sleeping meds. I wasn't having severe, I wasn't having psychotic episodes. I wasn't having severe um, swings in depression. So I got, by 2007, I was just down to lithium and um, doing really well. And during this 40 day fast, I felt like I, I should go off that. And I did. And um, I, I've never, from that time, I have never taken another med relating to bipolar disorder. I remember the first day I went to church after going out with him. We had done, Doug and I had done this free, free rummage sale. So we invited a bunch of our friends together and we just gave everything away. We had a rummage sale, but nothing was for sale. And we gave away refrigerators and lots of clothes and lots of toys and to this neighborhood that we lived in that was pretty poor. It was a really great time. Well, someone had taken some pictures of that. And when I went into church the next day, they were showing some pictures of this. And I remember walking into the sanctuary I'm feeling the presence of the Lord, seeing those pictures. And it was the first time that I had really fully experienced God's pleasure um, after, you know, going off all of that and going, finishing that fast. Um, the next several years were spent navigating how do I become a woman? How, what does it mean to be a woman? What, what are the agreements that I've made that have caused me to so reject femininity? What, where's the pain in that? Yeah. And, and a lot of the sexual abuse, I had to work out in intimacy with my husband. And, and he and I together, um, when we first got married, um, I could not be present with him. And, and so we walked together through that. And I think it's important really to say, maybe, you know, that prayerfully, we brought the Lord into our intimate life in order to make it possible for me to overcome obstacles that had been created in my life. And if, if we hadn't have been able to really submit our sexual lives to the Lord, I probably wouldn't be able to do this today. It's like I allowed myself to be fully known by the Lord in the middle of my sexuality and by my husband in the middle of my sexuality. Yeah. And that's, that's not something that I can give to somebody. That, that's not something I could counsel another person into. But it's certainly something that the Lord can do for someone. Um, not just if you have lesbianism in your past, yeah. you know? Um, Doug and I moved to Reading in 2013. And I would say that by 2013, I was feeling healthier than I had ever felt before, but still not fully, what I would call not fully integrated, like not feeling um, completely comfortable. Still at the time, yeah. the worst possible scenario would be a women's conference. Like I, I just felt so much yeah. less than all of the rest of the women in a, in a women's conference, you know? Like, I remember the first one that I went to, I had to ask, I called Doug, I said, come and get me, please. I can't take it, I can't do it. Um, because I just felt condemned. No one was condemning me. And I think mean, this is telling because I think a lot of LGBT identifying people come into the church and they feel condemned. No one's doing that and that's an inner, that's an inner conflict, yeah. you know, that's an inner voice that you're having. And so I had to start working out, gosh, what, what, what is a woman? What do women do? Um, I've, I had rejected having children, um, which uh, was a, a non-issue 
until I was in my mid 40s. When I was in my mid 40s, so I was starting to get healthy. So I was 45 in 2015. Um, then I thought, oh, I missed it. Some people said, well, you could have children. I just did not want to try to start having children in my mid 40s. And, um, but, but the reality of my, my womanhood and that aspect of my, my life as a woman, um, that I was never able to give myself to, to bearing and cherishing and nurturing and raising a child is a significant loss for me. Um, for that experience. And, and I think the disconnect of, of being a mother, like now I'm supposedly a spiritual mother, right? And so I've had to really lean into the Lord to understand how to get a hold of that, how to apprehend that, yeah. you know? And in our culture where women are more and more being encouraged, no, nah, don't have children, or um, being a woman doesn't involve having children, or it doesn't yeah. involve being a mother or a wife, there's a loss in that. Mm -hmm. um, and so then today, in terms of my same-sex attraction, um, what I began learning, the, the healing path that the Lord took me on, once I started to be able to learn to relate and understand a language with the Lord, then I was able to access him for understanding of myself. The process was I got an understanding of who God was, and then I was able to get an understanding of who I was. And in my dialogue with the Lord, I began to learn that I could question Him about what I was feeling. And I developed a dialogue with Him where if I felt a, a connection to a woman or a strong attraction, um, it didn't, be, didn't begin with a sexual desire, it, it began with a strong attraction or some affinity that yeah. felt unnatural, yeah. like an unnatural attraction, um, then I would start asking the Lord questions. Why am I feeling this way? Where, where did this come from? Why did, why did I start turning to these feelings? What was femininity or what was lesbianism to me? Yeah. How did it supply a need? Where was that coming from? And, and so, you know, I learned that there were times when I would turn to women for nurture when I was feeling insecure or when I was in a moment of comparison or in a moment of uncertainty. Like maybe my context is I'm doing this filming project and, and... Even, would it be even, you mentioned comparison, even in comparison to other women comparing yourself because there might have from a young age been times where you didn't relate to what would be considered feminine qualities. And so when you would compare yourself to other women, it's like, I can't even, can't even be that. So I would just default to more masculine qualities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so the comparison isn't even with, you know, from person to person, it can even be in, I just don't feel feminine enough to be in this sex group. Uh, yeah. But, um, I think you, you would even agree that having more or less feminine or masculine qualities doesn't necessarily have influence on your sexual identity because there can be men who are more caring, more um, nurturing than some other men who just might be considered, you know, rough or, um, you know, just the typical expectancies of whatever sex groups and stuff are. Mm -hmm. But um, you can still have more masculine qualities um, as far as things you just might relate to, but still embrace that I'm a woman or that mm -hmm. I'm a man or yeah. vice versa. Yeah, I mean, I think important in that conversation is what is stereotype? Mm -hmm. What is my perception of masculinity? Like I, I, often, I often want to point out that there is actually nothing in me that is masculine. Physically, 
There's no physically. physically yes. Okay. There's no way yeah. I can experience masculinity. No, like, that's good. Like down to the cellular level, mm. I am female. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, my whole body structure that's informed by my reproductive system and the hormones that are involved to support that, that system actually builds my whole body. My body's, you know, pretty much built around my reproduction system, yeah. right? And, and so there's nothing physically that can be masculine about me. Yeah. And so if I'm gonna say I'm masculine, then I, what I'm doing is my perception of what masculinity is, mm. uh, that has to be born out of stereotype, yeah. Like, this is what we believe masculine looks like. And this is where like. that gray area gets, where I think a lot of people find themselves contemplating a lot, is yeah. in these stereotypes. Like, that's often... Right. Am I non-gender conforming? Well, yeah. no, like, I can, there, I can do the most non-gender conforming thing. Let's see, what would that be? Like, a, a wrestler or a boxer or there's something that really leans heavily on physicality. Mm -hmm. Um, I can be really domineering and, and aggressive, um, but those are all my perception of what masculinity is because I know men who are nurturing and compassionate, yeah. and then when I see them nurturing and compassionate, do I think they're feminine? Yeah. Um, no, that's just my perception of what masculinity and femininity mm. are based on stereotype. Mm. And so, you know, I think it's essential that we actually begin to reassociate with our bodies mm. in this conversation. That's a whole yeah. different conversation. Yeah. But like for me, in the context of a group of women, when I was never given, I was never given instruction on what is meaningful about wearing makeup or like, why do women wear, why do women wear makeup? What's up with that? Why would I, why would I do that? Or um, why would I value my physique? I'm actually pretty delicate. I'm a petite woman. So why would I value that as opposed to force myself out of it? Like, you know, I used to be a really aggressive motorcycle rider to just push the envelope, try to push me out of being um, stereotypically soft. Um, all those things came into play with my sense of, of lesbianism, okay? Because I, I was, a, as a lesbian, very strong, very dominating. Um, I attempted to be very dominating. Um, the process, though, with the Lord would be, all right, so this is happening. Why? You know, one of the most important, um, one of the most important times, this is just a really great example of how the Lord approached me on my sexuality. He invited me to take Doug to Chicago, to where I had been living. And my understanding of the trip was, it was a kind of reverse treasure hunt, where the Lord wanted me to go into these different places. I could take Doug, but the idea was I would go into these different places and I would hear what the Lord had to say. And so I went to Boys Town in Chicago, places I used to hang out all the time. I went into gay bars, um, went into nostalgia shops. I stopped in dildo shops. I mean, I went into all the places where I would have found myself when I lived there and, and just listened for the Lord. And he told me all these different interesting things about what I was looking for, what what did this give me? What was the gratification that I found in these places? Then at one point, we went to this, to this feminist bookstore. And it was a place I went regularly. And I was looking around at all the, the bookstalls, and I wasn't quite sure what the Lord would talk to me through. So, I mean, I was picking up everything that I would have picked up in the time. Um, lesbian porn, lesbian magazines, feminist books. And at one point, I'm standing over this bunch of books, and the Lord prompted me to look back at the clerk that was behind the register in the back of the store. And he, and he said, go take a look at her. Turn around take a look at her. Would you have dated her? And I, I looked at her, and I thought, yeah, probably. She looks pretty cute. 
And so the Lord said, okay, describe her to me. So I started describing her. She had short hair. She looked intellectual. She looked kind of earthly, or earthy. She looked athletic. Um, and the Lord said, right, describe yourself. It said, got mm. short hair, yeah. intellectual, kind of earthy, athletic. And the Lord said, yeah, in that season, all the women in that season, all the women you dated looked and were like you because you were so desperate to love yourself, but you were unable to. So you chose women who were like you to love because you had so much self-hate. Wow. And it was that experience over and over and over again of let's unpack what was really going on when you were having these attractions, what was happening, that it demystified the whole experience for me so that I didn't have to, I didn't have to put lesbianism in this category of dysfunction yeah. or disease yes. or yeah. biological. Yeah. It's so good. It was, oh, there was a real need. Yeah. There was something significant and I was using that to get my needs met. Wow. And I, I think actually today, very few people are being encouraged to go on that journey because it, the LGB topic is so radically charged. It's politically charged. It's emotionally charged. It's spiritually charged. And so there aren't very many places where a person can just sit with the Lord and say, okay, let's unravel it. Without the pressure of, okay, today you're not going to have any more same-sex feelings. Mm -hmm. Like, or if you ever feel this way again, then you're unredeemed or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, this process for me took years. But the Lord never put me under the pressure of, you're only acceptable to me if you never have these feelings again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was, oh, let me help you see. I, I saw your entire life. I have always known you. And so let me help you to see what actually happened in your life mm. and how you became the way you are today. And let's in the process discover who you are today and who you're becoming. Um, and, and it's really that place that I am so deeply driven to create for people with the LGBT experience. That's fine. You're experiencing same-sex attraction, but let's understand more about it. Yeah. And let's, let's give you a context where you can actually start to get these, these needs met. You can understand what you need. You can understand why you're so uncomfortable with men or with women. Mm -hmm. You know, For me, it was with both. Men were not safe. I wanted to be able to punch a man out. Women were not safe. I didn't feel like one of you. Yeah. And, and so let's work all of that out in the midst of the congregation where you can be authentic with it and not rejected, like there are no standards that you have to meet other than surrender, wholehearted devotion to Jesus for the truth of what he offers, which is redemption of your sexuality. Like he is creating, he's bringing his kingdom to earth. That means we get to experience something of his kingdom today. Yeah. And we have to be contending for all that's available. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of us are gonna be trans, uh, transfigured. Like, mm -hmm. we're all still gonna be grappling with the effects of immorality and sin in our lives, probably until he comes. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we just don't contend for it, or we don't pursue it, or we don't try to, yeah. to work through the, the real and understandable and tangible breakdowns of the developmental process, mm. you know? Um, that can be accessed. Wow, yeah. Uh, and so all the way through your story, and if there's a, an end part of your story or like if there's a period on it, I want you to make sure to add it. But um, what led you through that journey, the moment a chapter turned for you would have been when you said, I'm going to look into scripture and see who God is and I don't care what it costs me. I want to know him. And whatever that, um, however that affects 
my own life and my own identity and every aspect of it, I'm willing to lay it down to find out who this God is. Mm -hmm. And that's, would you say that would be a pivotal point of what led Mm -hmm. you through these questions? Absolutely. Because otherwise, so I was making an exchange Mm. in a sense. If, If I let go of what I believed was important in my life, but didn't have a robust understanding of what I what is available. And it wasn't, what was available wasn't, oh, my mental well-being or my sexuality. It was this transcendent experience of God. Mm. Um, it was easy to make that decision because I had such an anticipation of mm. what is possible to experience of God's love. And that was what I laid down my life for. I didn't surrender all, all that I believed about myself and all of my brokenness. I didn't surrender that so that I could get some attainable sense of personality or mm-hmm. I did, because God is transcendent. I couldn't define what I was going after. I just knew that it was the thing that was the most, that had the most worth of anything I could ever access. Wow. And, and that's what I went after. Wow. I'm still going after that. Yeah, I'm still. Wow. I love that. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for yeah, sharing. My pleasure. This Thanks for listening. Part of to your me. story.